CIA operative Alex Mason suddenly awakens and he finds himself strapped to a chair with a thumping white noise of monitors all around him. He is almost blinded by the light when he notices two men in a room. They are speaking to him through a microphone and they begin to bombard him with questions. At first, Alex refuses to answer them, but they continue to torture him and they ask about these random numbers that appear on the screen and they continue to ask him about a man named Dragovich. They began to ask Alex about a mission in 1961 that took place in Cuba alongside his comrades Bowman and Frank Woods. Here Alex is taken back to that moment and we relive what happened the exact day of the mission which was April 17, 1961. Mason, Woods and Joseph Bowman are in Cuba to assassinate Fidel Castro and help CIA sponsored Cuban exiles in overthrowing Fidel Castro's communist regime. Mason and Woods seem to find and kill Fidel Castro in his bedroom. Trying to make an escape via an airport runway that was nearby. But the CIA's Cuban rebels are losing against Castro's armed forces, and they have set a blockade at the end of the runway, so there isn't enough time or enough room to take off. Here Alex decides to jump off the plane and clear the blockade with a turret. Woods is angry at this, but Mason did what he thought was right. And with this, Bowman and Woods leave Cuba, and Alex Mason stays behind. However, mere moments later, Mason is knocked out and captured. His captor is Fidel Castro, who reveals that they assassinated a body double. Castro gives Mason to Major General Nikita Dracovich as a gift, and Alex Mason would be held captive at the Vorkuta Gulag, a Russian labor camp, and he would be there for two long days years. With this we return to present day and the interrogators begin to ask Mason questions about his capture and what happened while he was taken by Dragovich. Alex informs them that he lived through hell and he had almost given up on ever escaping that terrible place. But a year into his captivity he met with Viktor Renzov who was a former member of the Soviet Union army. Alex refers to Viktor as a friend in the interrogation and suddenly we are taken back to October 6, 1963. Here we find out that Viktor and Alex planned a prison uprising and fought their way out of Vorkuta. However, when they made it out to freedom, Alex hopped on a train and waited for Victor, but he took off in a different direction. And as we go back to present day, Alex says that this was the last he saw of Victor, at least for a while. And the interrogators begin to badger him some more and question his loyalty to the United States. They believe that he's been compromised due to his friendship with a known Soviet threat. However, we are taken back to November 10th, 1963, a month after the escape. Alex Mason was tested and cleared for duty once again. He was back on assignment. His handler, Jason Hudson, was escorting him to meet with President John F. Kennedy. And on the right there, Mason meets with the Secretary of the United States, who informs him that they want Dragovich killed. When Mason enters the Pentagon, his head begins to hurt and he continues to hear a thumping sound. He describes it like a dream or being in two places at once. When Mason Mason meets with the president, he blacks in and out, and he even has a vision of himself pointing a gun at JFK. He snaps out of it, and the president confirms and authorizes the assassination of General Dragovich. He wants Mason to do this as he's the best operative that they've got. Now a week later on November 17th, 1963, Alex Mason alongside his comrades Frank Woods and Joseph Bowman reunite for a mission which is to infiltrate the USSR space program located in Baikonur. Intel suggested that General Dragovich would be there. Mason is looking to kill and eradicate Dragovich. They run into heavy resistance at the space program, but they push through and are able to stop two rockets from launching. Mason snaps out of the flashback and we return to present day. The two unknown interrogators begin to ask Mason about Dragovich and he explains that Woods believed that they had killed him, but they couldn't confirm the kill and Alex Mason had a gut feeling that Dragovich was still alive. Here it's revealed that Mason would go on to spend the next five years searching for Dragovich. He says that he felt him everywhere. The people holding Mason captive shift the conversation back to the past and on February 2nd 1968 in Hue City during the Tet Offensive Mason established contact with a Russian defector who apparently had a dossier with information on Dragovich. Mason risked his life and put the lives of his comrades in danger by heading into the middle of that war zone to try and recover the dossier. When he reached his contact, he realized that it was Viktor Ranzov, Mason's friend from years ago. Apparently, Dragovich is planning something big, an attack that could destroy the West and the United States. Reznov informs Mason that Dragovich must be stopped at all costs. With the dossier in their possession, Dragovich's allies and their information is revealed. One of them is Kravchenko, who is a Soviet colonel, Dr. Steiner, who is a Soviet scientist, and Dr. Clark, who is a chemical engineer. All these men were a part of Project Nova, which was a nuclear submarine. And now we return once more to the present day. Alex Mason gets angry and says that all these questions are pointless as they already know everything that has happened. However, the captors reveal that they don't know what the numbers they keep showing him mean or even where they are broadcasted from. Here we realize that this may be their ultimate goal. 
and we go back in time once more to February 9th, 1968, where Hudson and Weaver have been sent to Hong Kong to capture Dr. Daniel Clark. Here we see Hudson question Clark on his relationship with Dragovich. However, they are ambushed by Dragovich's men and they make a run for it. During the escape, Clark reveals the location of Dr. Steiner, which is in a facility located in Yamantau, where he is finishing up preparations for the Nova 6 project. Clark reveals that the project's success relies on numbers, and Hudson asks what kind of numbers, but Clark is shot in the head as he is about to reveal what they are used for. And now back once again in present day, amid further interrogation, Mason reveals the story behind the friendship of Dragovich, his right-hand man Lev Krivchenko, and German ally Dr. Friedrich Steiner. The story was told to him by Renznoff, and the story takes place sometime after World War II. Here, Dragovich discovers the German biochemical weapon Nova 6, and he decides to sacrifice his own soldiers so that he can witness the effects of the weapon, including Reznov's close friend, Dmitry Pentrenko. We head back to February 9th, 1968. Mason and his SOG team are in Vietnam trying to capture Kravchenko. Mason and his team fight through Viet Cong controlled territory. However, they fail to capture and eliminate Kravchenko. And we quickly cut back to present day. Here, Mason is being hammered by his captors. They tell him that Reznov is not his friend and that he isn't who he thinks he is. Mason refused this and we head right back into 1968, this time on February 11th, two days after failing to kill Kravchenko. Mason and his team are sent to locate a downed Soviet plane containing the Nova 6 gas, but during this investigation, Woods and Bowman are captured by the Viet Cong and presumed dead. Mason is taken by Dragovich and Kravchenko, who were in Laos. We are back in present day, and the interrogator explains to Mason that his handler Hudson had to continue the search for the Nova gas without him. Once again, we go back in time to February 18th, 1968, where Agent Hudson was sent to Yamantau to infiltrate the center where Nova 6 was made. Upon entering the facility control room, they realize that it has been rigged with explosives by Dragovich. However, Hudson's team is contacted remotely by Dr. Steiner, who reveals Dragovich has set sleeper agents all over the United States for years, and in less than 36 hours, these agents will receive their final order to release Nova 6 all over America. Dr. Steiner reveals his location and promises to help them crack the numbers broadcast. All this because Dragovich is killing everyone connected to Project 6 and Dr. Steiner is seeking protection. We head back to present day. Mason reveals to the interrogators how his comrade Bowman was killed during their capture by the Viet Cong and how he and Woods managed to escape. This took place on February 19th, 1968. Mason and Woods fought their way through the war zone that is Vietnam to reach Kravchenko's base. Once they arrived there, Mason met with Reznov once again, who led him through the base to Kravchenko. And when the trio confronted Kravchenko, a fight broke out and Kravchenko focused on Mason. However, Woods sneaked up behind him and stabbed him. Kravchenko then pulled a pin off of a grenade that he had strapped to his chest and Woods jumped out of the window with Kravchenko, seemingly sacrificing himself and saving Mason in the process. After this, Mason and Reznov cover the documents that would lead them to Rebirth Island, where Dr. Steiner was located. However, we find ourselves back in present day and the interrogator begins to badger Mason on his relationship with Reznov. Mason loses it and he goes right back to February 1968, only a couple days after the death of Kravchenko. He tells the interrogators that when they reached the island, they snuck in the facility and Reznov murdered Dr. Steiner right in front of him. However, the interrogator cuts him off and tells him that Reznov did not kill Steiner, that it was actually in fact Mason who did it, and that Agent Hudson saw it with his own eye. Back in the present day for the last time, Hudson reveals himself and Weaver to be the interrogators and confronts Mason face to face. Hudson reveals that while at Vorkuta, Mason was subjected to severe mental reconditioning in order to turn him into a sleeper agent who would perform Soviet missions in America, including the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. However, Reznov hijacked this programming while in prison and used it to have Mason complete Reznov's thirst for revenge to kill Dragovich, Kravchenko, and Steiner. It is revealed that Reznov never actually escaped Vorkuta and he died during the breakout attempt and the Soviet defector that he met in Hugh was dead by the time Mason reached him. Mason's visions of Reznov were a direct result of a disassociative disorder caused by the traumatic brainwashing program that he was a part of. Agent Hudson attempts to reach Alex once more. With the revelation of the number station being located in Cuba, the team head out to infiltrate the ship Rusalka. Mason and Hudson infiltrate the underwater base protecting the ship, and Hudson caused the United States Navy to destroy Rusalka. Moments later, Hudson and Mason confront Dragovich, who shoots at Hudson, but Mason manages to get a hold of him and drowns. With Dragovich finally killed, Mason escapes with Hudson, and they declare victory. Sometime later, Mason finds out that Frank Woods didn't die in the explosion during their fight with Kravchenko, and he is actually being kept a prisoner at the Hanoi Hilton. Mm -hmm. 
It is now the 1980s, and Alex Mason, alongside Frank Woods, will be teaming up with CIA operative mystery man Russell Adler as President Ronald Reagan has assigned a black ops mission to take out a Soviet Union spy known by his alias Perseus. This Soviet spy has been a part of major catastrophes for the United States, including stealing information out of the Manhattan Project in 1943. Then in 1968, Perseus attempted to steal a nuclear bomb during the Vietnam War. Now, 16 years later, in 1981, Perseus is once again again plotting an attack on the United States. Five weeks after putting his team together, Russell Adler is in West Berlin following a lead on Perseus. Hudson, however, is wary of the task force that Adler chose and is keeping a close eye on Adler, Bell, and the rest of the team. He does not know if he trusts them fully, but for now he will support the task force and their hunt for the Soviet agent Perseus. Bell meets with Adler at a CIA safe house. They will be doing some sort of memory training exercise on Sergeant Bell. During this, Bell is taken mentally to 1968 where he recalls the events almost perfectly. Adler sends Sim and Bell to secure a valuable asset in a nearby firebase. During their search for this asset, they find two Soviet soldiers. Bell and Sims kill them and retrieve important intel off of them, this being the clue they overlooked years ago. After this, they rendezvous with Adler and head over to Ripcord Firebase. Upon getting there, Sim realizes that the asset they have picked up is a nuke. Four hours later, Bell wakes up from the memory exercise and they begin to scavenge through the intel that they picked up. They uncover some important names that could lead them closer to Perseus. One of the names uncovered during the memory exercise was Anton Volkov, who is now a Russian arms dealer who supplies not only for Perseus, but many of the biggest organized crime bosses around the world. Neutralizing Volkov will have a big impact on organized crime as a whole. Hudson informs Adler and the team that his asset in East Berlin has a way of catching Anton. He is due to pick up a package from Franz Kraus, who is Volkov's chief courier in a bar near Kraus' apartment. Adler and Bell make their way onto a roof near the meeting place to scope out any signs of Kraus. After a little while, they get eyes on the courier. Bell heads down and goes inside the bar and plants a listening device while he sits in with Hudson's asset. While they wait, Hudson's asset, named Greta, informs Bell that a spy of hers has been captured by Volkov's people. She would like Bell to either free him or eliminate him. If Bell gets a chance, he will take care of the spy. However, the conversation is interrupted when a man comes in the bar and informs Kraus that the meeting place has been changed because he was followed. Kraus leaves the apartment and Bell makes a quick escape through the bathroom. Bell heads over to meet Lazar and Park who are inside of a small store in front of Kraus' apartment. They inform Bell that he will infiltrate the apartment and put a tracking device inside of Kraus' briefcase. He finds a secret room in Kraus' office and puts a tracker inside of the briefcase and is about to head out when he hears muffled screaming through the closet. A while later, Bell wakes up and he is in a warehouse with Greta. They are both tied up and being questioned by Anton Volkov. Moments later, Volkov decides to kill Bell, but before doing so, Adler and the team come to the rescue. Volkov quickly makes a run for it and the team follows him. Bell catches up to him and takes him out. In the briefcase recovered from Volkov, we find out that Perseus used East Berlin to smuggle a nuclear device. The team believes Perseus has stored them in an unpopulated area in Ukraine. Adler has Woods and Mason go over to assist. Bell and Woods make their way to the base in Ukraine. They silently infiltrate it and make their way through the underground levels. They find a control room and a computer that seems to have very valuable information on it. There's a file on there titled Operation Greenlight. Bell and Woods listen to it and hear the voices of Hudson and the director of operations. Here they discover that the nuclear weapon smuggled out of Berlin by Perseus is American. Hudson says that they will take care of it and keep control of the asset, and they will also keep this information a secret from Adler's team. Woods is rightly pissed off. They make their way out of the base and regroup. From there, they head over to meet with Hudson, as he has some explaining to do. Sometime later, we see Adler, Mason, and Woods headed to meet Hudson. As they arrive, an angry Woods gets out of the car and attacks Hudson. Adler asks everyone to calm down and questions Hudson on what they heard regarding Operation Greenlight. Now that the team know that Perseus is looking to detonate the nuke and make the United States the enemy, Adler understands they need to move fast. The team search leads them to Yamantau, as MI6 has an insider named Belikov within the KGB that confirms there is an active operation going on there. Yamantau, years earlier, was a base for the Soviet Union where Major General Nikita Dragovich worked on a gas named Nova 6 that would brainwash US agents positioned in different parts of the United States. However, Alex Mason killed the general 
general and prevented the Nova 6 gas from ever being deployed. Perseus is now on the hunt for something inside of Yamantau. Adler is sending Mason back to the Soviet's base alongside Woods to find whatever Perseus is looking for first. Mason and Woods arrive in Mount Yamantau, where they find a mainframe, which they steal and they deliver it to Hudson. He has his team analyze it and four days later they find out that Perseus was looking for the names of the sleeper agents that were used in 1968. Hudson asks for those names, but Perseus has deleted them from the mainframe, and the only place that they can now be found is inside the KGB headquarters, in their bunker at the Lub Yanka building. Belikov receives a phone call from Adler, where he tells him they need his help getting inside the KGB building. During the phone call, Belikov is summoned to meet with Secretary Gorbachev, having summoned him to a meeting. Belikov makes his way there to find some of his comrades and two men, one named Zakaev and one named Kravchenko, who are investigating a mole within the KGB. Belikov feels that they are onto him, so he plans to frame a general in the KGB named Charkov. Kravchenko informs Belikov that in a couple of hours they will know from which computer the mole operates. Belikov knows that his computer will be the one that will be discovered, so he quickly makes his way into the server room and redirects the evidence to General Charkov. He prints out the evidence, he takes it to Kravchenko and successfully frames Charkov. Belikov uses this opportunity to steal the general's keycard. He heads over to the boiler room and opens the door for Adler and Bell. They disguise themselves as KGB members and make their way to the bunker. As they make their way through security, they run into trouble, but Belikov helps them. After this, they head to the elevator to go to the bottom floor. Before the elevator door closes, Sakaev goes inside and is suspicious of Adler and Bell. That suspicion gets him knocked out. Upon arriving on the bottom floor, Adler and Bell begin to take out any KGB soldier standing in their way on their path to the bunker. The whole building is on high alert. After a heavy assault, they make it to the bunker and copy the sleeper agent's names onto a disk drive. As they make their way out, they are blocked by KGB soldiers holding Belikov hostage. Somehow, they find out he was the actual Adler and Bell rescue him and they make an escape together. With the name of the sleeper agents in their possession, they discover that a nuclear engineer named Theodore Hastings was part of Operation Greenlight. The team will keep tabs on him as they believe he will lead them to Perseus. Which rings true when Hastings decides to get on a plane and leave the United States for Cuba. The team are alerted to this and head there immediately as they believe they will find Perseus there. Once they arrive at an abandoned compound, the team must make their way through and find where Hastings is. The team split. Bell, Park, and Lazar find CCTVs that show Perseus entering the room where Hastings is and shoots everyone inside. They head towards that room, but Perseus seems to be gone. A severely injured Hastings lets them know that Perseus has stolen the activation codes for the nukes, all of the nukes. The team must now make a quick exit. They fight their way through the compound and onto the roof where they will be picked up. However, they are receiving heavy fire and an RPG hits them before boarding the chopper. Bell has a harness already on him and he can save either Park or Lazar, and in a moment of high stress, he chooses Park. A little while later, we find Bell being dragged inside of the CIA safe house where he is strapped down and seemingly forced into another memory exercise by Bell, Park, and Sims. They believe Bell holds the key to finding out where Perseus has those nukes located. Here we begin an excruciating process where the truth of what's going on is finally revealed. Bell is not CIA. He did not serve with Adler in Vietnam, and he isn't even American. He was a high-ranking member and a trusted protege of Perseus. He was captured by Adler, Mason, and Woods during a mission at an airstrip a couple of months ago, where they retrieved valuable information on Perseus. Bell, you were one of Perseus's agents. His associate, Arash Kadavar, turned on you at the airstrip in Turkey. During this memory exercise, Bell remembers almost everything. Here he has a choice, help Adler and the CIA stop the nukes from going off and killing half of Europe while at the same time truly turning on Perseus by revealing where he is. Or he can lie and pledge his loyalty to Perseus. Bell decides to help Adler and the CIA willingly revealing that Perseus is in Solovetsky. The team heads to Solovetsky and they have 12 minutes to stop the nukes from going off. After a heavy fight against Perseus' men, they are able to stop the bombs from going off, securing America's way of life and saving millions from dying in Europe. However, Perseus once again flees. It was never personal. After killing Bell, Adler continues his search for Perseus. However, unbeknownst to Adler, Perseus would succumb to cancer in 1983, ending his life never being captured by the CIA and maybe more importantly, avoiding the relentless Russell Adler. However, Perseus' work and his Nova 6 dream would continue as a new leader would emerge following his death, named Vikor Stitch Kuzmin, who had worked firsthand with the Nova 6 gas back in the 60s and worked under Lev Kravchenko. 
but in 1968, Kuzmin would be captured by Russell Adler and the CIA. Adler would question Kuzmin and would take out his eye in hopes of retrieving any information that they could out of him. But Kuzmin would survive the interrogation and then he would be sent to a gulag as he looked like a failure for being captured by the CIA. Sometime after Kuzmin was sent to the gulag, Perseus reached out to him and turned him into one of his agents. Perseus knew that the knowledge that Kuzmin held was invaluable as he worked with Nova 6 firsthand. And in 1976, Perseus would free Kuzmin from the gulag and they would work side by side until 1983 when he became the new leader of the Perseus organization. However, Kuzmin wanted revenge on Adler and led him into a trap on January 24th, 1984. A few months later, on April 19th, 1984, Kuzmin and his Perseus organization transported Adler to Verdansk while leading Frank Woods and other NATO operatives to pursue a false lead about Nova 6 production in Laos. While Frank Woods rescue team was distracted by the false lead, Kuzmin would torture Russell Adler and sent two of his operators, Helvig and Gray, to infiltrate a KGB black site in Mount Yamantau and steal data from the brainwashing project conducted by Nikita Dragovich on Alex Mason during the 1960s. After the information was extracted and the Perseus team left the base, they destroyed it with a nuclear bomb. In Verdansk, Kuzmin informed his team that his work with Adler was near completion and that he would do what Dragovich only managed with a single subject to entire nations, paving way for Perseus' original goal of a greater Russia. Kuzmin would finish his work on Russell Adler by brainwashing him the same way that Dragovich did Mason years ago. And a few days later, on June 10, 1984, Adler was rescued by Frank Woods. 16 days later, on June 26, two satellites were crashed by a Perseus operative one landed in Verdansk while the other landed in Algeria. Adler alongside Jabari Salah and other NATO operatives would head to the crash site in Algeria to secure a data recorder from the satellite. Adler charged right into the fight on his own without his team and he stole the satellite data recorder. He would begin to work off the grid on an unknown project in Verdansk. Later, we find Woods and Hudson meeting privately. On August 2nd, 1984, Mason captures Adler and brings him to the same interrogation room that Hudson and Weaver put him in after killing Steiner in 1968. Woods, Hudson, Mason, and Adler travel to Verdansk and on August 19th, they find Kuzmin sitting near a solitary grave in the woods. In 2025, a US Special Operations team led by David Mason and Mike Harper arrive at the Vault, which is a top security retirement home for United States operatives, and it is the location of Frank Woods, who is now a 95-year-old man. The team is there because they suspect that Woods holds a valuable information that can lead them to the capture of Raul Menendez. Raul Menendez is a terrorist that threats the United States. He is a Nicaraguan who has had a deadly vendetta against the West and has been working on their demise since the 1980s. Raul had some encounters with Alex Mason and Frank Woods over 30 years ago. Woods tells David Mason and Harper that Menendez has recently visited him and gave him a golden pendant. Woods begins to tell the two operatives about the events that occurred during his active duty years and their hunt for Menendez, who back in the 80s was the leader of the Menendez cartel and was supplying illegal arms to the Soviets. Woods begins to tell David that his father Alex Mason was retired back in 1986. After his wife's death, he wanted to stay with his son and look after him. But Jason Hudson came to Mason after Woods and his team were captured in Cuando Cubango. Uh, they were there assisting the UNITA rebels. Mason would come out of retirement to save Frank Woods. And after Mason and Hudson recover Woods from Cuando Cubango, they locate a young Raul Menendez, who was among several Cuban military advisors. Mason catches Menendez, but is interrupted by Cuban soldiers. And as Raul attempts to escape, Mason shoots him in the face, wounding the Nicaraguan. However, Mason makes a run for it after a firefight breaks out and he alongside Woods and his team are rescued by a helicopter and they make their escape. Woods reveals that it was Menendez who took him captive after they were captured and Menendez killed his team. With this information, the team began to hunt down Menendez and after Woods recovers, they meet with Chinese operative Tian Chao and an Afghan rebel group known as the Mujahideen in Soviet-occupied Afghanistan. The CIA believe that Menendez is currently hiding out there. As we know, Lev Krichenko survived the explosion alongside Frank Woods back in Black Ops 1, and he is also rumored to be in Afghanistan. The CIA, Chow, and the Mujahideen locate and capture Kravchenko, and Woods begins to question him on the location of Menendez. And after Kravchenko reveals some terrifying truths about Menendez, Mason executes him, and suddenly the Mujahideen betray Woods, Mason, and Chow. The Afghan rebels take the trio and leave them to die in the desert. It is revealed that the Mujahideen 
Dean were secretly working with Menendez. However, the trio is rescued by some civilians passing through. After this, Woods, Mason, and Hudson work with General Manuel Noriega of Panama to capture Menendez who is hiding out in his plantation in Nicaragua. Noriega's men raid the compound and capture Menendez, but Noriega begins to kill his own men and takes Menendez to a hill before the CIA can get to him. Menendez, however, is angry since his sister Josefina was still inside. Menendez beats Noriega and runs back to get his sister. However, he is stopped by Hudson and Frank Woods throws a grenade that ends up in Josefina's room, which kills Menendez's sister, and they believe that it also killed Menendez. However, Raul would survive this explosion and hide out in Panama with the help of Manuel Noriega. Menendez would come out of the shadows, however, in 1989 during the invasion of Panama, where Menendez is able to capture Jason Hudson and a young David Mason. He uses Hudson to relay false information to Woods in an attempt to trick Woods into killing Alex Mason. Woods shoots Mason, apparently killing him, and when it is revealed to Woods who he truly shot, he is angry but is ambushed by Raul Menendez who shoots Woods in both of his legs leaving him a cripple. Woods is dragged to a room where David and Hudson were being held. We also see the body of Alex Mason and Menendez begins to explain why this happened. Your best friend Alex Mason is dead by your own hand. Do you understand why? He was gonna kill David. Because you must suffer as I have suffered. Now one more must die. You Woods, or David, make a decision now or in 10 seconds you're all dead. Woods, I can't. I have two kids. They... Fuck! Okay, me! Do it! Do it! <laughs> 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 Your life will be consumed by absolute loss. Then and only then will you understand what you have done to me.